Okay, so previously we've been using the truth table method to judge whether an argument is valid. And this method is certainly effective, but it also has a number of limitations. For one thing, it doesn't really reflect how people actually reason about logical arguments. With the truth table method, you basically make a table with all of the possible ways that the world could be, and then check one by one whether every world in which the premises are true the conclusion is true as well. And that's way too much information for someone to keep in their head at one time. Another problem is that truth tables just take up too much space. So consider the following argument. P, therefore, P or Q and R implies S and T. How would we go about and construct a truth table for this argument? Well, we need four rows to make a truth table that has two different propositional variables. And we need eight rows if we have three different variables. So that's 16 rows for four different variables. And since the conclusion of this argument actually has five different variables, we would need a truth table with 32 rows. That's a ton of work just to prove this little argument. So as it turns out, with natural deduction, we'll be able to prove this argument with just one line. Okay, so let's get started. As you read in the text, with natural deduction, we identify a basic set of inference patterns that we know make for valid arguments. And then when we want to construct a complex proof, we string these patterns together in order to show that you can move from the premises to the conclusion using only these basic rules. So one way to think of it is like a game or a puzzle where you start with the premises and the inference rules tells you what moves are legal in the game and then you try to see if you can come up with a path to the conclusion. So we'll quickly review the inference rules that we covered in the text but I won't have much more to say about them since they are so basic as to not need much explanation. First, simplification. With simplification, we simply use the fact that if a conjunction is true, then each of its conjuncts or individual components must be true individually. So if you have a conjunction in your proof, you can always pull out one of the conjuncts into its own line. And since we don't care about the order of the conjuncts, it doesn't matter if you derive the first conjunct or the second conjunct. So if I have P and Q somewhere in my proof, then at a later line I can also write P. Or if I have P and Q written previous my proof, I can also just write Q. And remember, these don't have to be simple statements like P, Q, etc. The arguments could themselves be complex. Okay, next we have conjunction, which is sort of the opposite of simplification. For conjunction to be true, each of the individual conjuncts must also be true. So you can always take two lines that appear previously in the proof, such as P and Q, and combine them together into a conjunction. Of course, this applies to complex statements as well, and not just atomic propositions like P or Q. But here, if we have a proof where somewhere it says P, and on another line it says Q, then you can always add the line P and Q. Next, we have modus ponens which applies to conditional statements. With the conditional, we know that if the antecedent, the first part, is true, then the consequent, which is the second part, is true. So if you have a conditional in your proof, and you also have the antecedent asserted independently, then you can immediately infer the consequent. All right, so here we have P implies Q, and then we also have P, which is the antecedent, so we get to infer Q. I often use visual metaphors to think about these rules, so maybe this will help you. But you might think of a conditional like P arrow sign Q as sort of like a train that takes you from one place, P, to another, Q. So then if you buy a ticket for the train at P, you will end up at Q. Uh, whether that sort of visual metaphor helps you is, of course, up to you. Now, with modus tollens, Again, we have something sort of like the opposite of modus ponens. We know that the first statement, P implies Q, is true, but then we find out that Q is false. 
So how can P implies Q be true? Well, the only way for that a conditional could be true if the consequent is false is if the antecedent is false as well. So that means that if the negation of, a con of the consequent of a conditional appears, we know we can derive the negation of the antecedent as well. So here we have P implies Q and then not Q and we were able to derive not P. Finally, one last rule for this week known as addition. Addition is rather simple, and it works off of the fact that for a disjunction to be true, only one of the disjuncts has to be true. So once you've asserted some statement in your proof, like P, like P or indeed any complex statement, you can go ahead and add any statement whatsoever to that statement as a disjunction. That's because whether the statement you are adding is true or false, the disjunction will already be guaranteed to be true no matter what, because you're starting with a true statement, which is in this case P. So if I have P in my proof, then I can derive P or Q, P or R, P or S, or any other of those statements. Okay? All right, so now let's just um, look at a couple different simple proofs so we can get some practice on the notation and how to apply these rules. So consider this proof, P and Q and R and S, and the con and, uh, implies Q and R. So is this a valid proof? Maybe take a moment and think about if you can use the rules that we've identified to move from the premise to the conclusion. In any case, let's look at how one might do that. So as always, you want to start your proofs by writing the premises on their own lines and indicating that they are a premise in the proof. So here I'm just repeating the first premise and stating on the right-hand side that it is a premise. Remember, for proofs, on the left-hand side goes the actual proposition, and on the right-hand side you write the justification or basis for that line in the proof. Okay, now in line two, I apply the rule of simplification to line one to derive the proposition P and Q. So line one is a complex conjunction which has two parts. The, le the left hand side is P and Q, the right hand side is R and S. So I use simplification and I derive the left hand side of that conjunction on its own to get P and Q. Now I apply simplification once again. This time I am applying it to line two, as you can see. On the right hand side, the notation says three. Simplification, citing line two, means that I've derived line three, which is Q, by applying simplification to line two. In this case, deriving the right hand side of the conjunction. Now, one more application of the rule of simplification. Uh, in this case, I'm going back to the premise P and Q and R and S, and this time I'm extracting this, the right-hand conjunct, which is R and S, and giving it its own line. Um, so I have R and S on line four, citing simplification to line one. And I believe I have a little bit of a typo on simplification, but that shouldn't affect the quality of the proof. Now, one more application of simplification again. This time I'm applying simplification to line four, R and S, and I'm using it to derive R on its own. Now, think about what I'm actually trying to prove. The ultimate conclusion of this argument is Q and R. So if Q and R is true, then I need to have proven that Q is true, and I need to have proven that R is true. So after all these applications of simplification, now in line three, I have Q independently, and I have R independently in line five, so I can use the rule of conjunction, actually I should say conjunction, not addition, uh, to derive Q and R. So Q and R applied to line um, three and five gives me Q and R, and addition is incorrect, that should say conjunction as the rule going to line six. All right, let's take a look at uh, another proof here. The premises here are P implies Q, not Q, 
therefore not P or R. Okay, so see if you can take a moment and try and create a proof for this um, argument. And now we'll go through it and see what we can do. So first, again, we're going to start by just stating the premises in the proof as lines in the proof and indicating that they are premises. So first premise is P implies Q. Second premise is negation of Q. Okay, now I'm deriving the negation of P and I'm using modus tollens, which again, modus tollens is when you have a conditional and you have the negation of the consequent that allows you to infer the negation of the antecedent. So here I have P implies Q and then not Q. Not Q is the negation of Q. So now that I have that, I can go back to the negation of P. So I'm using modus tollens on lines one and two to derive the negation of P. Now, look at my conclusion that I'm ultimately trying to get at. It's not P or R. I mean, in general, when you're doing these proofs, you want to always look at the conclusion first and see what are the pieces that are going to make up this conclusion. And you want always to be aiming at making moves that are going to bring you closer to um, the conclusion. So in this case, I have used modus tollens to derive this line not p. Not p is part of the statement that I'm trying to prove, so it seems like I'm making progress towards uh, my goal. And indeed, now that I have not p, I can derive the conclusion not p or r using the rule of addition. Addition applies to disjunction, and it says that whenever you have a statement, you can make a disjunction with that statement and any other statement. So I've already proven not p in line three, and now I can add not P or R by way of addition, citing line three. And that's my ultimate goal and proof. Okay. So let's take a look at one more. Here we're trying to prove from the premises P implies not Q or R and Q to the statement not P and Q. Okay, how are we gonna do this? Take a moment, try and be, see if you can come up with a solution. Okay, now let's uh, look at what we can do. We'll start as usual by stating the premise. P implies not Q or R. Uh, second premise is simply Q. So now, how am I going to connect these? I should always be thinking, what are the connections that I see between the premises? Is there any way that I can uh, link up with the information that I have with the premises? So I see in, in line two, I have Q. In line one, I have Q, but it's something that's disjoined with R. So I have a Q and R. So is there any way I could kind of get from Q to something closer to what I'm looking for, which is Q and R? Well, again, I could apply the rule of addition to Q to uh, create Q and R. So I use addition derived uh, applied to line two. And now I have the statement Q and R. And this seems to me something that is a component of the first premise. So maybe I can use that to somehow get to the conclusion that I'm looking for. Okay, what's the next move I'm going to make? Well, Okay, now let's see what's going on. In line three, we derived Q and R. And we see that in the premise one, Q and R, or actually the negation of Q and R, is the consequent of this conditional P implies not Q and R. Okay, so not Q and R is the consequent of that conditional. Now in line three, we derive Q and R. And not Q and R is the negation of Q and R. So whenever you have the negation of a consequent in a conditional, then you can use modus tollens to get to the, the negation of the antecedent. So in this case, the consequent is itself a complex statement. It's a disjunction. But still, the negation of that disjunction would allow us to apply the rule of modus tollens. So we use modus tollens applied to lines 
uh, one and three, although I don't think that's indicated there, that's incorrect. It should cite lines one and three on line four. Okay, that allows us to derive not P. Now, how do we get to the final conclusion, not P and Q? Well, not P and Q is a conjunction. And in order to have a conjunction, you need to have each of the individual conjuncts having been asserted, asserted independently in the proof. And indeed, we have. In line two, we see that we already have Q. And in line four, we see that we've derived not P. So, we can put those together using the rule of conjunction and form not P and Q, which is the uh, ultimate goal of this argument. So despite this minor error in uh, citations that we see with modus tollens, which should be citing lines one and three, we see now we have a complete proof, which allows us to get from the premises of the conclusion it's uh, a lot certainly more compact than the kind of proof that we would have had to use if we were doing this using the truth table method and hopefully it follows something a little bit more like the way that we naturally think about um, following logical arguments okay so in this section we introduced the general strategy of natural deduction we went over some of the more basic rules of inference that are part of natural deduction systems, such as simplification, conjunction, modus polens, modus tollens, and addition.